Hello, welcome back to another music nugget and today is all about how to make a synthesizer basically or how to program any synthesizer when you know a few principles about synthesizers and things that you expect to see. We're all used to playing with soft synths and seeing things that are labelled ENV or ADSR or OSC or LFO or VCA but what on earth do any of these things mean? And uh, what does it mean in terms of sound and in terms of functionality, how we can play these sounds? So today is all about building a synth, building a signal flow, trying to understand these different abbreviations, and also looking at different types of synthesizers and controllers. Today I'm gonna to use something that is capable of showing you all of these different things but it's also perfect if you're working on a budget because this thing here is an Axolotti DSP synthesizer. So it basically comes as a circuit board from a guy in Belgium and it started, a, it started as a Kickstarter project and it is capable of generating almost any waveform you can imagine. It has two audio inputs, two audio outputs, so it's great for effects processing. Um, it has MIDI in and MIDI out, both DIN MIDI and USB MIDI, so you can use two separate controllers. You can have one for all your knobs and faders and buttons, and you can have keyboards or even, as a guitarist, this is the, the sort of thing that I use to get the, the language in there. This is in a language that I understand, basically, um, but works just like a keyboard, and we'll get to that. So. There's a lot to do here, and I'm going to zip through it as quickly as possible whilst actually explaining things. So first of all, we need a sound source. This is the programming environment for the Axolotti hardware. So it allows you to program a synthesizer, completely tweak it and spend a long time getting it working exactly the way you want with your controllers sounding exactly the way you want, things happening within ranges exactly the way you want, and it comes out customised and very personal to you. But when you're finished doing it on here, you can upload it, you can dump it to the unit, and it just behaves like a normal instrument that you would power up, taking it to any gig without a computer. That's the crucial thing. And it's what I like so much about it. The thing that I like the most about it is that it costs €65, Euros, which is a drop in the ocean compared to what you would pay for a MOOC synthesizer or some expensive piece of hardware gear or even for a laptop setup that's capable of running the sort of sounds that you want um, can often be problematic things like latency, the delay between playing a note and then hearing it back um, all these things you basically don't have to worry about with this 65 euro piece of gear which is incredible so, first of all, we need a sound source. I'm going to start off with a sine wave sound source. A sine wave is the purest tone you can have. It has no harmonics. Um, so it will just sound very pure and clean and bell-like. And then we have some sort of means for getting it out of the system. So I'm going to type in stereo, or even half of stereo and I can pull up a stereo output here. You can see that it's got little VU meters for the left and right. And if I just create a mixer, let's give us plenty of options. I'll go for, a, well, let's give us a couple of options at least. A two output audio, two input audio mixer. And we'll send that sine wave to the first input. I'm going to actually just scale it a little bit here as well. So what I'm using here is a math object that's just slightly less DSP intensive than an actual audio mixer. That allows me to keep the volume bearable. And you can see that we've got the signal chain going from the sine wave being attenuated and then going into the mixer which we can attenuate from there and so 
This is the patch in edit mode just now. When I hit the live button here, you'll see that the screen changes color. We have some DSP load up here. And when I turn this up, we should have a pure sign tone. And at the moment, all we can do with that is turn this control knob here to change the pitch. Because there's nothing except in any note information from any device at the moment except the mouse. So we can do this. But that's about it. In order to have it respond into notes, we need to put in a MIDI controller object or a MIDI note object. The software here is really quite similar to a lot of things that you would find in more complex VST instruments. So Reactor is one that comes to mind where you've got real flexibility over all your control options. Um, a lot of the time in certain software since this will just be hidden under the hood and you won't have to worry about your note input because it happens automatically. Um, but it's good to know about this stuff just in terms of understanding how everything works. So if I type in MIDI in keyboard, I'll just bring in, not that one, the simplest MIDI keyboard object I can. And anything that's control information is blue signals. So if I connect the note output to the pitch input, note output of my MIDI in to pitch input of the sine wave, then that should, when we have the volume up, control the pitch of notes. And it does, that's exactly what we want, but you'll notice that the note carries on from whichever the last one you played was. That's because at the moment we're not telling any gate information from when we attack each note and when we take our fingers off to make the note clamp down and go back to zero. <clears throat> so to do that, that's another thing that you would have seen in different synthesizers. Sometimes the abbreviation ENV is used, ENV, sometimes ADSR, sometimes AD. These all just refer to things that happen from the action of playing the note. So they're volume ramps, essentially. Another thing that you might see sometimes is VCA, which is an old term from hardware gear, which means voltage controlled amplifier. In this case, the voltage that's controlling the amplifier is the control signal coming from the, the envelope. And then it's the actual volume of the note that you're passing through this voltage controlled amplifier. So this ADSR part. <coughs> ADSR basically means attack, decay, sustain, release. Put simply, that is, if I make this live again, it's much easier for you to equate it with something that you're hearing. So if I just have attack and decay to begin with, we'll take release and sustain out of the, the equation. So that's an attack of almost 0 milliseconds, we've got 2.4 milliseconds. Um, so that's as short as it can be and it'll sound percussive. Now the decay is how long it takes the note to decay when you're holding your finger down on the note. So if I make that really short, then it's nothing but a blip. And as I turn that up gradually, You can hear that now it's set to just over half a second. And it has quite a natural sound in decay as it dies off. The sustain is, once it's decayed, what level it will sustain at. So if I've got it at a quarter, then it will die down to a quarter of the volume and it will stay at that quarter of the volume until I release the note. And then the release part is how long it will take
to die away when I take my, my finger off the note. So I have the attack is percussive, decay, sustaining at a lower volume, and then when I release the note, it's going to take a second and a half, 1.47 seconds, to completely die off. So it's low volume, but it's still there. And then when I take my, I'll just turn it up a bit so you can hear that. In fact, I'll turn the sustain up. When I take my finger off here, you'll hear that it takes some second and a half to die off. So that's envelopes in a nutshell. So what next? What else can you do with a synthesizer? First of all, the sine wave that you have here, a lot of the time you will have modulation options on sine wave oscillators. So you can do things like run another sine wave into that waveform and alter the the trajectory of that waveform with another waveform and create really complex sounds. So on this particular sine wave oscillator, we have a frequency modulation input and a phase modulation input. And they basically act on the main waveform in different ways when they're accepting another waveform. Um, put very simply in terms of sound, the frequency modulation input can be more wild and erratic and difficult to tune and the phase modulation is a lot more manageable but they both have very interesting sounds. So if I just copy, merely copy this sine wave and on this software you can just do control C, control V like you normally would. We're going to make that one the FM oscillator so we'll just label it so that things don't get out of control. bring it all in line and then we'll paste another one in and this one is going to be the PM, the phase modulation oscillator and we'll send the note information from the MIDI keyboard to the pitch input of those and also we want to have some way of attenuating how much we modulate the frequency of the other waveform or how much of these new ones we feed into the master. So we can use VCAs the same way that we did before. First of all I'm just going to use a mixer to demonstrate. How these things sound without anything, any envelopes acting on the modulation. So one going into the frequency, one going into the phase, and we'll start off with zero, and we'll make it live. Okay, so that's the sine wave, pure as it was when we started. Now if I just keep that note held down and bring in the frequency modulation, You can see that it adds characteristics, it adds harmonics to this signal, it makes it more buzzy, brighter sounding. And the phase will do the same thing when they're so a slightly different character, a slightly different timbre. Um, that gets a lot more interesting when they are different pitches. So if I was to make the FM oscillator uh, an octave below, minus 12 semitones, below the master oscillator that's when it starts to get more interesting, more tonally interesting um, and you can go quite extreme with that, you can have two octaves below not two octaves above now you're getting into exciting synthesis realms. Um, where it gets even more exciting is if you put VCAs, some more voltage controlled amplifiers, in between those and the master wave. 
and you use the envelope to shape how much of that is going into the signal based on when you hit the notes. So control information from the envelope into both VCAs and now we still have volume control over how much goes into it. So at this point our volume is still at zero so that's not going to do anything. But if I turn that up, then you'll hear that the modulation has a decay in the same way that the note does. And you'll recognise those kind of sounds from John Carpenter movies, maybe. Um, so all of these things do exist on analog synthesizers. Here's the phase modulation. Um, doing the same thing, taking its shape from the envelope. Now that one's still at the same pitch as the the main wave. What we can do is we'll make that one just an octave below. Minus 12. And you hear that you, you have all this tonal variety again. Right, I'm going to do something now. We could do loads more stuff with the waveforms. Um, and in fact, we will do one more thing. I'm going to add in a square wave. Because what we've been dealing with here, and that's a LFO, not an oscillator. What we've been doing here is using really pure sine waves and modulating those to give it extra harmonics, but a square wave actually starts off with lots of harmonics, and so it's naturally buzzy sounding. And when you go to use filters and uh, similar effects, they all really work on the high frequencies, and that's where all these harmonics live. So it makes a lot of sense to have a square wave in there so that you can really shape all these different frequencies too. Um, we'll do something interesting. We'll go for a square wave with sync. And we'll pass the original sine wave into the sync input. Now, before I do that, I'll just let you hear how the square wave sounds on its own and we need to run pitch control into there. So here's the square wave on its own. So you can hear that in contrast to the sine wave that we just had, that is almost the opposite. It's extremely buzzy, extremely harmonically rich. Usually square waves are made by summing sine waves. Um, as things get more and more digital, that's not always the case. But um, that's why these things have more harmonics, these, these waveforms, because they are actually several different sine waves, often lots and lots of sine waves, overlaid, mixed together at different pitches. And that changes the overall shape of the wave into something a lot harsher, in this case, a square-shaped wave. Um, so that was that waveform on its own. If we put the master sine wave into the sync input, then basically the square wave, with all its tonality and harmonics, is locked to the pitch of the sine wave, and it allows you to do super cool stuff with the pitch of the square wave. It allows you to make it sound like a, a really harsh screaming filter. Um, that you can sweep through harmonics with. So that's the square wave at the same pitch as the sine, and when I move the pitch of that, the pitch itself doesn't move. The It's all the frequencies and harmonics that move, so...
which is great fun. Um, so now what I'm going to do, one, one last thing. We, I mentioned LFO really briefly at the beginning. And LFO means low frequency oscillator. So it's still a waveform, it's just moving much more slowly. And what they're commonly used for is controlling things. So rather than using the envelope here to control a volume curve from a note, you could use an LFO to make a volume constantly move up and down, like a tremolo effect. Or if you're sending it left and right, then it could be a pan effect that's moving really regularly. And the speed of these things can be changed dynamically. So if I use a sine LFO here, then we have that really smooth shape of wave, which is great for smooth vibrato and things like that. And this time it has to affect the note output. So I need to create a little mixer here, a control mixer this time, which I can determine the level of the LFO, but also I can have the master note signal staying at one level going through that mixer. So basically, however much I adjust this control is how m how deep a vibrato we have because it's working on the pitch side of things. Now I actually have to attenuate that because it's working on a semitone level. So I'm going to bring in one of those math objects to control it, this time on the control level, blue signals. And I'm going to set that to just two. In fact, I'm going to set this one to 2 and use this as the vibrato depth because I'm not sure that this works on a semitone level. So at the bottom, there's no vibrato. On the top, there's two semitones wide of vibra vibrato. And we'll just demonstrate that. And the actual LFO controller here, that's the speed of the vibrato. So if I bring that back in... So you can hear that there's a tiny bit of that in there. And even when I take that tiny bit off, it becomes a lot purer. When I turn that up... Now the reason I've scaled that is because if I do this... Then it's fun sound, but not too useful for many things. So, I'm just going to name a couple of things. At this stage, we're ready to make this patch polyphonic. At the moment, you'll notice that it's just one voice. You can't play two notes at once. And this is a common thing when you're building synthesizers in um, prototyping environments. So the next stage of this, I'll show you how to turn this into a multi-voice synth sound. Okay, so at this stage, this is a good, simple synth voice setup. Um, and what, what I mean by that is, at the moment it's playing polyphonically, and it's because of the way that a lot of these prototyping and uh, software sound design environments work. You have to build a voice that is monophonic and then bring it into a, the same environment effectively, but bring it in as a polyphonic object. Polyphonic just means you can play more than one note at one time. So at the moment, I cannot play chords with this, even if I try. It will just glitch to the most recent note that you've performed. Um, so the next stage is to prep this a little bit. What I need to do... This is going to become an object in itself. So you see all these objects here. They are what you call objects in this environment but I'm going to set it up so that whatever controls I want from this patch can be the controls on an object what I probably want to do is name some things as well so the mixer here I'll call this sign slash saw uh, or square rather And we'll call this FM amount. 
We'll call this one PM amount. These are good, they're named. I want these controls to be on the master object. And I want my vibrato controls to be. And we'll just call this pitch LFO just now because when the pitch bends very slowly, you can hardly call it vibrato. And LFO amount. I'm just going to make another one of these attenuators. so that the square and sine waves are balanced better. And then we're good to go. So what I need to do to make this capable of being polyphonic is I need to first go to settings. And what we're doing here is creating a sub patch. That, that's what makes an object from it. And I make it polyphonic, close that down. And then I also want to save as, and we'll call this Nugget. And you need to save it as a sub patch, then it knows that it's becoming an object. One last thing that we also need to do is create outlets, because we don't want a stereo out, we want our object to have an output, a red square to output the audio. So we just change that to an outlet. And what's also really useful is if we can have an outlet for the ADSR signal if we want to shape filters and such like. And also an outlet for the gate in case we want any of the note hits to do anything in our main patch. And we'll just call that output for the audio, ADSR for the ADSR, and gate for the note gates. Save it again so that all the changes are confirmed. And we can close that down. Just remember that we called it Nugget. Now we make our parent patch. You have to save that straight away in order for your sub patch to register. So we save it as an Axolotl patch instead of a sub patch. And we'll call this Big Nugget. Now when I double click in here, just like when I want to bring in objects, the oscillators and so on, I can also bring in by having full stop forward slash and then type in the name of our object, you can see that this Nugget comes up and it's a lot bigger than the other objects. The important thing here is that it's got polyphony. We can change it from one note polyphonic to, I can play six strings at once, so it makes sense to have six note polyphony. <coughs> then we have a stereo output again. And if we just connect that. Also what I'm gonna do, this is where we'll bring our MIDI controller into play. So what I want to do is put the ADSR, the Attack Decay Sustain Release. You want hands-on control with this stuff because so much of how you shape the sound comes from turning controls and moving sliders and not necessarily that much from how fast you play notes or things like that. Playing a synth is a very different thing to think about from playing a standard keyboard or a guitar. Um, so I'm going to make the Attack the fourth last fader. Basically I want these four faders to be the ADSR. So I'm going to, I know that they are 81 to 84. So attack, decay, 
83 and my release is 84 What I'm also going to do is give some of the other stuff control. So in this case, I'm going to make these four faders here. I'll make the first one sine volume and the other one square volume. So I know that that is 77 and 78. I'm also going to make the sign pitch on 79 probably not the most sensible layout but it gives you a chance to see how these are all choices that just affect your functionality how you interface with your machine <laughs> So now on these two faders we have sine volume and square volume. And they can be mixed. And on these two we should have the pitch of those two respective waveforms. So So that's the sine an octave below the square. The interesting thing is we synced the square wave so it can do all that screaming frequency stuff now when I move this control. And even cooler is our, uh, our envelope, our ADSR, now completely works so I can make a really slow fade in. And I can play cars now because it's polyphonic. Or I can turn those into simple bell-like tones that don't ring very long. And that's before we've even brought in the FM modulators or anything like that. So let's just do that. Let's make the FM, I'll put these on the top knobs here. So these work on the sine wave, but because the sine wave is sync modulating the square wave, it'll also work on the square wave, probably with messy results at times. So I'm going to make the FM amount the top left knob. I'm going to make the FM oscillator pitch the one next to that. I know that that's CC 13 and 14. Then I need to find the pulse modulation amount. I'm going to make that 15. And then the pulse modulation pitch. I'll make that 16. I'm also going to set some controls for our LFO, so for that I'll make them the next two, in fact I'll make them the last two knobs, so that, no I'm going to make them these, 17 and 18, so there's the amount, the LFO amount, and then there's the LFO speed on 18. So I'll make it unlive and make it live again so that the changes can take take place. So if I turn the sustain up there, I can just demonstrate some of these things. So I can bring the FM in. And the pitch of that can be changed. And also the pulse code modulation. Interesting. And then there's the LFO depth. So 
so that's your vibrato. Okay, so we've looked at all these different modulations, your vibrato. <laughs> your oscillator sync, um, different types of modulation, FM and PM, frequency modulation and phase modulation. Um, I'm going to just quickly introduce two things that make a synth a lot more texture rich and playable. And that is, I want a filter. I'm going to use in here what's called VCF3 and it's just the, the third iteration of the VCF is something that you'll see in older synthesizer and it means voltage controlled filter um, the voltage control is just the control signal coming in the blue input if you think about it like that in real circuitry terms um, and what it is actually is a low pass filter so it sweeps out high frequencies depending on the pitch control. Quite often you'll see the term pitch here replaced with cutoff um, and frequency is how the signal peaks at whatever that, that that frequency there, the resonance control sorry, is how the signal peaks and it just makes it sound more extreme. It's easier to understand if I simply put the thing in. And also we'll make the note and the envelope control the pitch of it too, so that we have movement in the same way that we had with our FM modulation. So I'm just going to use a mixer to attenuate that. It's not the cheapest way to do it, but we're working quickly. And we just run, we take out the audio signal and we put that in between the synth voice and the filter. Now one last thing that we're going to do is we're going to bring in a tape delay object to put after the filter. And we might as well make it stereo because we have the option. So this will take a mono signal and give it stereo space, which is great because everything we've been doing until now has been working in mono. The same on left and right. So now I'll finally just put the pitch control and the, free, the resonance on the last two knobs on the top row. I know that those are 19 and 20. So now when I turn this on, I'm going to make the, I'm going to take the delay out, so I'll just make that completely dry signal. But you'll notice even with the pitch where it is, that has really filtered out the buzzy harmonics at the top end. And it's actually made it a lot more palatable, a lot softer sounding. But if I sweep through that, that's the sound that we're used to hearing, especially if we boost the resonance and you really start to hear the harmonics sweeping. So, like this. And it can be more responsive with low notes. Kind of just depends what your source sound is with this. So that's what filters do, what a low pass filter does more specifically. This control here will take the shape of the envelope and it will apply that to the pitch control. So when you bring in 
this mix control here, you're sending the envelope shape, the control information of the envelope shape, to the filter pitch or cutoff. Um, and that will basically open and close the filter in the same way that the volume of the note opens and closes. So if we have the, the same sound, the sharp attack, I'll do it without the, the envelope information at the moment. You hear how that has a certain way that the note dies, it takes the same amount of time with each note. The filter will do the same to open and close, and it depends how much you've got this is this engaged. So and it's you'll have heard that sound a lot as well. That's classic P funk kind of sounds, I guess. When guitarists and bass players talk about envelope followers or envelope filters, that's what this means. Basically, it's a filter following an envelope. Um, so all these terms overlap in loads of different worlds. So that's the thing that I'm trying to get across here is that th this stuff is invaluably useful no matter what level you're using it on. It'll just help you understand what you're using, even if the terms are kind of interchangeable, and also be able to create a sound a lot quicker, knowing that this is going to do a certain thing for you, that's going to do a certain thing for you, and so on. So the only thing that's left to do is bring in our delay, and that's really just um, effects. Now this is just set a certain way. Let's make the left and right time different. Okay, and we'll turn up the feedback. So I'll just add a bit of ambience to the sound, which is really nice if it's a really dry sound, and that's what synthesizers can be with the way that you put them together. Let's make it wetter still. Open up the filter a little bit. A little bit too wet. Okay, so now what we have effectively, this is as far as I want to take this. Um, we have quite a basic but very useful functional uh, synthesizer with controllers that you, you could use for a number of different applications, recording, live performance. Um, we have two waveforms, very different waveforms from each other. We have the sine wave on its own. And we still have some vibrato on that. So we have vibrato control as well. So we have very soft sounds. These are all with delay on. I'm not going to take it off just now. We have square wave. For crazy high energy sounds. That is oscillator sync. And you can mix the two. And we have our filter. And we have our ADSR, so we can shape the note. We can have it taking a long time to fade in. We can do really ambient stuff with it. And that is only using just over half of the CPU potential of this synthesizer. So, and you can be a lot more economical with the way you program it. So it's really as powerful stuff. Axolotti is the name of the synthesizer. Uh, it only costs 65 euros. Thoroughly recommend it. 
and we'll be doing several more synthesis tutorials with the synthesizer and, and with other types of software like Pure Data and Max MSP and just using hardware synthesizers so stick around for those. Thanks again for watching.